If your perfect feminist society was suddenly taken over by an army of brewski-pounding bros, what would you do? When a rift between realities leads to trouble in paradise, Barbie and Ken must venture to LA to set things right once again. But while she's busy facing the struggles of real-life womanhood, he learns of an unbelievable secret that ends up turning both of their worlds completely upside down. It turns out that patriarchy in plastic isn't so fantastic. So stick around because we're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Ken revolution in Barbie. <laughs> This iconic doll is about to have the first bad day of her life. At the dawn of feminism, there was Barbie. She stood some 40 feet tall and her giant plastic head could blot out the sun. Inspired by her magnificent womanhood, the prehistoric little girls gave up playing with their baby dolls, casting off the shackles of traditional gender roles, and realizing that they were always meant to be so much more than simple wives, mothers, and homemakers. Now, they could be anything. Doctors, lawyers, scientists, athletes. No glass ceiling was too high, and the real world became a bastion for women's liberation and equal rights, just as it was in Barbie land. Or at least, that's what the Barbies thought. In Barbie land, everything is perfect. Stereotypical Barbie here wakes up every morning in her pink dream house, surrounded by other Barbies, all living their best lives in this flawless, matriarchal utopia. Even discontinued dolls like her best friend, Pregnant Midge, are welcome here in Barbie land. Because in this society, all girls are created equal, and no one is forced to live as a second-class citizen. Well, there is someone who doesn't see things quite the same. Ken, the golden retriever-brained eternal sidekick to all of Barbie's girl-bossing exploits. Beach Ken here is the Kenest Ken of them all, and he's locked in a constant struggle with the other Kens for Barbie's undivided attention. There's also Alan here, who's awkwardly one of a kind and pretty much just does his own thing. In a bid to win Barbie over for the day, Beach Ken takes up his surfboard and rushes out to catch a gnarly plastic wave only to be sent flying dozens of feet through the air. The plan works almost too well, because not only does this get Barbie's attention, but it sparks a confrontation with his arch rival Ken, which escalates until the two are threatening to beach each other off right there in front of everyone. Thankfully, stereotypical Barbie steps in before things get ugly, and after being checked out by a team of Barbie EMTs, Ken secures an invite to a party at her house later that night. Okay, these girls need to be careful. Right now, it probably seems like nothing can ever go wrong in Barbie land. But all that it takes is one bad apple to spoil the bunch. And when I say one bad apple, I'm talking, of course, about Ken. He might seem harmless right now, but based on their interactions so far, it isn't difficult to imagine how quickly things could spiral out of control. I mean, just look at how he started acting the minute that Barbie showed up. His irresponsible desire for her attention nearly turned this peaceful day into a total bloodbath. Not only is Ken here willing to put his own life at risk to impress Barbie, but he's also ready to take out his competition if that's what he needs to do. You see, it's only a matter of time before this boils over and causes a problem. So they need to figure out a way to address this behavior and find an appropriate way for him to handle his emotions before it's too late. In order to do this, we need to understand what's going on with Ken psychologically so that we can take the right approach. Now, my first instinct here was to call Ken a narcissist, and there is some truth to that, mostly based on his compulsive need to be admired, instant jealousy whenever someone else gets any attention, and his willingness to manipulate the Barbies into giving him that attention however that he can. But there's a problem with this line of thinking. You see, true narcissists are first and foremost characterized by their exaggerated feelings of self-importance. And we know that Ken here only feels important when he has Barbie's attention. This means that he actually falls more closely into what's called histrionic personality disorder. As opposed to someone who's narcissistic, a histrionic person's sense of self-worth 
only comes from the approval of others. They're always seeking to be the center of attention and will readily participate in any manipulative behavior that's necessary to get there. Like how Ken here immediately decided to put himself in danger as soon as he noticed Barbie so much as say hi to anyone but him. Another telltale sign is a fondness for bright colored or revealing clothing. See how Ken wears his shirt open to show off his muscles. Unlike modestly dressed Alan by comparison, he's peacocking to get Barbie to notice him. And whether she's actually interested or not seems to have never even crossed his mind. They'll also display heavily exaggerated yet shallow and shifting emotions. Like how Ken went from injured to ready to throw down and then back to being hurt all in the span of a few minutes. Before this all goes too far, Barbie here should really pick up on the warning signs and start making the necessary changes to their relationship so as to not accidentally continue adding more fuel to the fire. For example, feeding into it by playing along and calling him brave for putting himself at risk is the worst possible thing that she could do. Instead, Barbie should establish firm but friendly boundaries and remind Ken that he's important to her as a friend no matter what he does, even if she doesn't ever see them getting together romantically. As for Ken, he needs to work on finding a way to determine his own self-worth without relying on attention from Barbie here to feel valued. I'd suggest a trip to therapist Barbie's office to work through his feelings or even forming a Ken support group where they can all get together and talk things out instead of participating in this constant one-upmanship. By continuing to baby him through it instead of flatly discouraging these attention-seeking behaviors, Barbie is only going to create more of a monster and it won't be long before he takes things to even further extremes. At the party, things started off friendly enough with the Barbies all hitting the dance floor and the Kens trying their hardest to play it cool. This tenuous pace lasts for about 30 seconds until Beach Ken here spots rival Ken putting the moves on his girl and decides that he needs to step in. The truth is that Barbie here couldn't be less interested in either of them, but that doesn't stop them from breaking out into a fully choreographed dance routine. While she's busy having the time of her life with her friends, they may be showing off as usual, but this time it surprisingly isn't the Kens who will kill the vibe. Seemingly out of nowhere, stereotypical Barbie here asks her girlfriends if they ever think about death, which brings the party to an abrupt halt until she quickly covers it up and gets back to having fun. The party goes on, but there's no denying that her plastic mask of perfection just slipped. Once everyone's gone home, Ken and Barbie finally get some alone time. He leans in for a kiss and asks to spend the night since, in his eyes, the two of them are dating but she turns him down and tells him to beat it. To her, Kens are just friends, and plus, she's got plans with the other girls. Because in Barbie's dream house, every night is girls' night. She leaves Ken out in the cold, feeling slightly heartbroken and a bit delusional about their relationship status. Neither of them realize it yet, but it won't be long before he makes a shocking discovery that completely changes everything. Okay, it looks like things are only getting worse. For Barbie, the party never ends, but when you're Ken, it seems like every social interaction ends up being a power struggle. We're seeing more evidence of that histrionic personality continue to pop up. For example, he tried to get her attention by busting out his dance moves in a competition with the other guys, instead of just approaching her like a normal person and became so preoccupied with showing off that he completely failed to notice that Barbie wasn't even paying attention. He also calls them boyfriend and girlfriend, despite the fact that Barbie here makes no attempt to hide that she clearly does not feel the same. I don't want you here. Thinking that relationships are closer than they really are is another major red flag of a histrionic personality, and they both need to take steps to get things under control before he completely flips out. If anything, Barbie here might be the one who's the real narcissist. Not to get down on her too hard, but from what we've seen, she's clearly very self-important, considers herself superior to Ken, 
and refuses to acknowledge his needs or feelings. Also, she lives in her own little world where everything needs to be absolutely perfect all of the time, is horribly afraid of change, has difficulty managing her own emotions, and is secretly harboring feelings of depression and anxiety that she'd rather cover up than address. Now, with that being said, Barbie definitely does not owe Ken here a relationship just because he wants one, but rejecting him so harshly runs the risk of hurting his fragile male ego. And when male egos get hurt, trouble always follows. If she wants to keep things from going sour, then Barbie here needs to turn Ken down politely but firmly in a way that minimizes hurting his feelings while still making it clear how she really feels. That's not easy, but when you see the consequences of what comes from her constantly ignoring him later, I'd suggest following the advice of relationship experts and listening to what he has to say. There's no need to get personal or make him feel inadequate, but you can't let the guy go around thinking that you're boyfriend and girlfriend when you clearly don't see it that way. Unfortunately, there's no way to control how he's going to react, but at the end of the day, that really shouldn't be Barbie's problem anyway, since it's ultimately Ken's own responsibility to learn how to handle rejection like a well-adjusted adult. Again, she doesn't owe him anything besides a firm no thank you, but if Barbie really wants to be nice, perhaps she could introduce him to one of her Barbie friends who might actually be interested, or suggest that he goes and hangs out with some of the other Kens instead, so that they can all bro out and uh, learn to support each other in a healthy way. Whatever she decides, allowing Ken to go around still thinking that there's a chance while constantly blowing him off for girls night every night is only going to make the situation worse. And she needs to be careful before he starts coming up with unhealthy solutions of his own. After a sleepless night, Barbie wakes up with the unshakable feeling that something is very wrong. She can't quite put her finger on it yet, but the vibes are completely off, although it's business as usual for the rest of Barbie land. Still, she goes down to the beach, as Barbies do, but that's when disaster strikes. When she takes off her heels to go for a run with her friends, suddenly she realizes that her feet are flat. The other Barbies are absolutely disgusted by this unprecedented medical anomaly, but once they finally get their involuntary gagging under control, they quickly determine that stereotypical Barbie here must be malfunctioning. They've never seen a case this bad, and there's only one Barbie in all of Barbie land who knows how to fix her, who becomes aware of forbidden knowledge after being played with a bit too hard for a few too many years. High in the hills on the edge of town, she arrives at an abstract and secluded dwelling, where she comes face to face with weird Barbie herself. After taking a look at her flat feet, the hermit asks Barbie here if she's been noticing any other symptoms, and reluctantly, she confesses to her recent thoughts of death. That's when weird Barbie figures it out. Somehow, someone has opened up a rift in the veil between Barbie land and the real world, and the only way for stereotypical Barbie to ever feel like herself again is for her to find a way to fix it. The longer that this is allowed to continue, the more imperfections will start to show up. Cellulite, difficult emotions, all of the things that make life for a real woman hard will start to eat away at her perfect plastic life, unless she travels into the real world, finds the little girl who's playing with her, and makes her happy again. Now Weird Barbie presents her with a choice, take the high heel and go back to her life in Barbie land, or take the Birkenstock and see how deep the Barbie hole goes. Well, Barbie here picks the high heel, but after remembering that this will mean more cellulite, she realizes that her only choice is to brave the real world. For this noble quest, she'll need to use several different types of whimsical transportation, until finally rollerblading into the human city of Los Angeles. There, she'll find the girl, and Weird Barbie reassures her that there's no need to overthink how. She'll know that she's got the right one. She just will. The other Barbies throw a party to see her off, convinced that the women of the real world will no doubt welcome her with open arms. Meanwhile, rival Ken starts taunting Beach Ken here for not getting invited along Barbie's road trip, but this ends up giving him an idea. A few miles down the pink brick road, Barbie screams out in shock when Ken pops up from her back seat. Although she really wants to send him back, he begs and pleads until, against her better judgment, she reluctantly agrees to let him tag along. But that was her biggest mistake.
Okay, talk about a bad idea. Barbie may not realize it yet, but this is going to get her entire society into a lot of trouble. Ken is virtually guaranteed to screw things up, and when you're setting out on a perilous journey between realities, that's no time to be dragging along the self-appointed boy toy here. Barbie had no problem turning him down before, but now, the one time that she agrees to entertain his cleanness is when she's about to embark on a very important and potentially dangerous mission? Not wise, Barbie. The moment that he popped up in the back seat, she needed to turn around and drop his plastic butt back off where he came from. After all, this is Barbie's adventure, not Barbie and Ken's. As a matter of fact, he was too afraid to even want to come on this trip in the first place, and only decided to stow away after making a double bet with rival Ken. Now with all of that being said, I will admit that Ken here could indeed make for a good meat shield if things start to get out of hand. As a bonus, he seems to have the power to recover from a severe injury miraculously quickly, although there's no telling if that will still work the same out in the real world. Whether Ken's coming or not, the primary objective for Barbie right now is to find the girl who's playing with her before it's too late. But how can she do that without knowing anything about her? According to Mattel, Barbie's target market is young girls aged approximately 3 to 12 years old. Census data shows that there are over 750,000 girls in that age group living in Los Angeles County, which means that Barbie here has definitely got her work cut out for her. There has to be a way to narrow it down, so here's what I'm thinking. We may not know that much about the girl, but what we do know is that she's experiencing feelings of depression and anxiety. Feelings like this are more common in older age groups than younger, so I'd suggest starting in the 12 to 13 year old range and working her way down from there. They're mostly brought on by problems either personally or at home and often manifest in the form of the girl having trouble at school. So knowing this, it might be possible to track the girl down by borrowing some credentials from teacher Barbie or school counselor Barbie and trying to blend in with the staff at the local schools, while asking around about any girls who may be new there, have been reporting feelings of depression or anxiety, or just generally looking to get into trouble. It looks like there are, give or take, about 100 middle schools in Los Angeles, so good luck. As it happens, one of the local schools is exactly where they're going to find the girl later that day, although Barbie here is going to take a much less practical approach. Now, finding the girl is only half of the battle. In order to really solve things, she's also going to have to find a way to make the girl feel better about her life. And as many of us are well aware, that's a lot easier said than done. But a grown adult can't just go and pull a stranger's kid out of school, even if they really are just a perfectly harmless children's toy that magically came to life. Or just maybe, there's a chance that she could skip the entire process by forgetting about the girl and going straight to Mattel, the company, instead to see if they can figure out a way to fix things. Like Weird Barbie said, they're the ones who make the rules. Barbie's quest is just getting started, but pretty soon she's going to have even more trouble on her hands. After a long journey, Barbie and Ken finally arrive in the real world, but it only takes a minute before they realize that it isn't quite how they expected. Both of them quickly notice that they stick out like sore thumbs, while Barbie here feels exceedingly concerned about all of the unwanted male attention that she's getting. Ken is eating it right up. Growing frustrated, Barbie decides that she needs to sit down and focus her thoughts towards finding the little girl. Well, Ken gets bored when people are thinking. So he asks for her permission to go off on a quick adventure of his own, and that's when he makes a game-changing discovery. Just down the street, the city is full of bros in sick jackets, broing it out at the gym, bros on horses, and bros conducting business. The men all respect each other, and most shocking of all, some of the women actually respect the men. It turns out that bros rule the world, and Ken here is absolutely loving it. Meanwhile, Barbie is busy thinking herself into an existential breakdown. Diving deep into her subconscious, she can see the memories of a real young girl's childhood, and follows the events of her life as she gets older and eventually grows apart from her mother. This must be the girl that she was sent to find, 
and based on the last memory, it looks like she could be at the local middle school. As she looks at the world around her with a fresh pair of eyes, Barbie begins to experience the complete range of human emotion all at once. But that's when Ken comes running back with some big news. They both shout out their discoveries at the same time, but Ken quickly decides to keep his a secret for now, and the two of them are set off towards the school to find Barbie's girl. It doesn't take long before Barbie and Ken's adventures in the real world become a matter of national security. At the worldwide Mattel headquarters, this low-ranking office worker, Aaron, gets a call from the FBI, informing him that two of their dolls are on the loose and were last seen rollerblading around in Santa Monica. It's up to Mattel to solve this problem before it gets any worse, leaving Aaron here with no other choice but to take the news all the way to the top. Outside of the CEO's office, he briefly stops to chat with the secretary, Gloria, who's lately been drawing up versions of Barbie with a more real-world twist. They sound awfully similar to what's been going on with stereotypical Barbie, but we'll circle back to that later, because right now, Aaron here has to deliver the bad news. The CEO nearly falls out of his chair when he hears what Aaron has to say, completely terrified of what can happen now that Barbie is out roaming the real world. He immediately calls for a citywide search, hell-bent on catching Barbie and putting her back in a box before it's too late, all while Gloria listens in through the door. Meanwhile, Barbie and Ken head down to the local school for the next stop on their quest. While Ken goes to the library to look for some more books on manly subjects, Barbie finds the girl from her memories sitting at one of the lunch tables, but is quickly warned by one of the other students that the girl is notoriously mean. Still, she decides to approach, only to realize that the warning was true. The girl, Sasha, absolutely rips her apart for holding feminists back and glorifying everything that's wrong with society's perception of what a woman should be. Having expected to be worshipped instead of hated, Barbie does not take this criticism well, and immediately runs away crying some tears of shame and regret. Ken, on the other hand, decides to go out and take advantage of his male privilege by getting himself a high-paying, influential job, but there's just one problem. It turns out that just being a conventionally attractive man is no longer enough. He needs qualifications. And without any skills to speak of, he quickly finds out that he isn't even qualified to beach here in the real world. Back at the school, Ken's discussing his ideas with one of the parents when he notices a truck full of men in black suits roll up on Barbie. They're agents from Mattel who've come to fix her, and while she happily agrees to go with them, Ken here instead decides to sneak away back to Barbie land, where he's going to tell the other Kens what he's discovered. Okay, this was bound to happen. Barbie here should have never let Ken out of her sight, and now she's about to be in even more trouble than she ever would have if he gets the other Kens involved in his patriarchy scheme. What's about to go down back in Barbie land is only half of the problem though because she just handed herself over to the Mattel Secret Service, and there's no telling what those guys have planned. Anytime that a bunch of suited up agents in a blacked out truck come looking for you, it's almost never a good thing. And if you see something like that, then you need to run, not walk, in the opposite direction. Because odds are, once you're getting into that truck, nobody is ever going to see or hear from you again. It's better to at least take your chances with running from them now, than trying to escape from their top secret facility later on, after all. With tons of people around and places to hide out, a school just might be one of the best places to flee from a team of fixers like this. So although it would have definitely been tough to shake them, at least Barbie might have stood some kind of a chance if she'd made a break for it. Unfortunately, she hasn't been in the real world long enough to know that guys in matching suits and sunglasses can't be trusted. And by the time that she figures it out, Ken's master plan will already be in full swing. As Barbie climbs into the agent's truck, Gloria here happens to pull into the parking lot right behind them. She's there to pick up her daughter, who turns out to be none other than Sasha herself, but before leaving, she realizes the truth about who Barbie is and decides to follow them instead of going home. The agents take Barbie back to Mattel HQ, where the CEO tells her that all of her problems will be solved if she just gets into the giant box. Happy to finally be respected again, Barbie enthusiastically agrees. But just when they start to twist-tie her 
in, she gets a gut feeling that something isn't right. At the last second, Barbie jumps back out of the box, saying that she wants to fix her hair in the restroom before she goes in, but making a break for the elevator the moment that she's out of sight. After a comedic chase sequence through the lower floors, Barbie manages to escape into a service hallway, where she finds an unlocked door. Across the room on the other side of an empty black void sits a mysterious old woman named Ruth, who is busy working on a scrapbook at her kitchen table. The woman invites her to have a seat and quickly points out that Barbie here looks different, but in a good way. It seems like Ruth knows more about her than she's letting on, but the conversation is quickly cut short when they hear the CEO and his goons closing in. Ruth points her to a secret exit, and she's able to make it out to the parking lot where she finds Gloria and Sasha just pulling up in their car. They wave for her to get in, and the three of them peel away, with two trucks full of agents in hot pursuit. Okay. Now we're talking. Up until now, we've been mostly dealing with chick stuff like emotions and relationship advice, but a car chase? That's something that I can work with. So the girls have two trucks of agents hot on their tail, and they need to shake them before they try to put Barbie back in a box. We're about to see that Gloria here is more than capable of holding her own in this scenario. But in case you ever end up with the men in black chasing you down, here's how to lose them. I might suggest trying to pull a quick pit maneuver on one of the vehicles to take them out of the chase. But Gloria doesn't want to hurt anyone or end up in jail, and also probably wants wants to keep her job, so we're going to have to avoid getting physical for now. This means that good old fashioned evasive driving is going to save the day. First off, in a high speed and high pressure situation like this, there are bound to be a lot of distractions. But you need to ignore those and always stay completely focused, looking in the direction that you want to go. Getting distracted for even a second could lead to a crash and end up with you getting caught if you're even lucky enough to survive, that is. To lose your pursuer, you need to use evasive driving to break their line of sight. Ducking around large vehicles on the road or buildings in the city should do the trick, and there's always the option of making a quick left across the lanes at an intersection so that the people chasing you get cut off by oncoming traffic, if you get the timing just right. If they can, the girls should either go back to Gloria's house and hide the car in her garage if she has one, or find a parking garage within the city to hide the car in as soon as possible, and then quickly get Barbie some more low-key clothes to try to help her blend in while they try to figure out what to do next. In the midst of their high-speed chase, the girls finally start to put together the truth about how all of this happened. It turns out that Gloria here began to get a bit lonely as she and her daughter grew further apart and so she decided to play with some of the girl's old Barbie dolls in hopes that the memories would make her feel better. Well, it ended up having the opposite effect, and the heartbroken feelings that she expressed in her sketches eventually started to manifest in Barbie land. Suddenly, Barbie realizes that she was actually meant to find Gloria all along and that the memories that she'd been seeing were really from the mother's perspective. With the agents closing in, Gloria slams on the brakes and cuts back up off of the highway before ducking into an alley as soon as they're out of sight. It works, but they can't hide forever, and that's when Barbie realizes what they need to do. It's time to go back to Barbie land, so that Gloria and Sasha here can finally see society as it was always meant to be. When the girls finally make it to Barbie land, they quickly realize that something isn't right. The Kens are suddenly pounding brewski beers and parading around like they own the place, while the Barbies are happily acting as their servants and cheering them on. At Barbie's dream house, they find the cause of the disturbance, Beach Ken now rocking three watches, a faux mink coat, and a steady buzz, and is holding court with the other Kens, explaining the benefits of a society ruled exclusively by men. As a matter of fact, this is no longer Barbie's dream house at all. It's Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House now, and he's not about to give it back. You see, Ken here liked what he saw back in Century City, but since he wasn't qualified enough to take things over out there, he decided to make Barbie land just like the real world instead. Having never even thought of the possibility of a patriarchy before, the Barbies actually decided that they liked the idea, since it gave them a break from the pressures of running things. With that, Barbie society quickly collapsed, and the era of Kendom land, land of the free and the men, had begun. In the Kendom, Kens are respected for just being themselves, and no longer have to live in Barbie's feminine shadow. It's actually been going so well that in just two days, they're holding a vote to amend the Constitution, giving Kens control over the government 
forever. He's not exactly happy to do it, but Ken here just can't resist the urge to finally give Barbie a taste of her own medicine. At Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House, every night is boys' night. And without the support of her friends, Barbie here is powerless to stop it because she never gave poor Ken the time of day. Now, Barbie feels like Ken did for the first time, and it hurts. Unable to bear the thought that things in her perfect world could ever change, she completely gives up, deciding to lay in one spot while she waits for another, stronger Barbie to figure it out instead. Disappointed, Gloria and Sasha try to talk her out of it, but are forced into heading back to the real world when they realize that there's nothing else that they can do. Okay, well. If it isn't the consequences of your actions. My oh my how the tables have turned, and it doesn't feel too good to be on the other end, now does it? It looks like your perfect little society is under new management, and sadly, you have only yourself to blame. I hate to say it, Barbie, but you have majorly f***ed up. I could have told you that treating Ken like an accessory was only going to end badly for you. Look, I'm not saying that you needed to go and date the guy out of pity either, but you never showed him any love or respect, and never even did him the courtesy of letting him down easy. It was always Barbie Land this, Barbie's Dream House that, Barbie's Big Adventure, while poor Ken was left to wither in the shadows like nothing more than an afterthought. Well, now that the high heel is on the other foot, I bet you're wishing that you'd approached things with a little bit of concern for him as a person, huh? You brought him into the real world, which obviously was a bad call, let him go running around on his own, and then still didn't listen to him when he slipped up and told you exactly what he was about to do. As a matter of fact, you were even so self-centered that you left him behind at the school when you got picked up by those Mattel agents without giving it a second thought. This turned out great for Ken, sure, but you were so worried about fixing yourself that you didn't even care to look around for him even for a second. That's cold, Barbie, even for somebody made entirely out of plastic. So, you come back to find that he Ken-pilled everyone with his newfound knowledge of the patriarchy. And what's the first thing you do, but immediately start trying to boss him around again? And in front of the boys, no less. In the world of men, that's about as embarrassing and emasculating as it gets, so it's no surprise that he didn't want to hear it. Worst of all is that, in the end, all you needed to do was just give the guy a hug and tell him that he matters, and he probably would have let the whole thing go. The reality is that he doesn't like this any more than you do. It was written all over your face if you bothered to look, but you couldn't see things from his perspective. And when the going got tough, you just decided to give up. Not exactly a role model move when you think about it. I know that your gut instinct is going to be to put the blame on Ken here, but maybe it was you who was the problem all along, or at least a part of it. After all, everyone really seems to like him now. When your mistakes create a monster of machismo who leads an army of bros to overthrow your perfect society, Barbie, you f***ed up. Sometime later, depressed Barbie here is woken up by weird Barbie, who takes her back to her dwelling on the outskirts of town. While Gloria and Sasha are driving back to the real world, they're surprised by Alan suddenly popping up from the back seat. He's the only guy who doesn't like how things have been going lately, and was trying to hitch a ride out before the Kens finished building their border wall, trapping him within the Kendom forever. It isn't long before they're confronted by a group of construction worker Kens, but Alan single-handedly holds them all off with his martial arts skills, while the girls decide what they need to do completely take over, and the three of them bravely decide to circle back towards Weird Barbie's house, determined to set things right. Once there, Gloria finds depressed Barbie and a few others still sulking in their defeat, with Weird Barbie unable to figure out a way to snap them out of it. Furious at the sight of her childhood heroes laid so low, she's inspired to give a rousing speech about the conflicting expectations that women face in the real world, and after hearing what she has to say, the Barbies suddenly begin to regain their self-confidence. Stereotypical Barbie is officially back, and now she has an idea. The plan is simple. By using one of their operatives, appearing as a clueless decoy, they're going to trick the Kens into mansplaining basic concepts, which should distract them long enough for the squad to extract and deprogram the brainwashed Barbies with Gloria's inspirational message, and rescue Barbie Land before it falls to the patriarchy forever. One by one, President Barbie, Lawyer Barbie, Physicist Barbie, and countless others are recruited to the cause, while the entire population of 
of Kens is none the wiser. Now it's time for phase two. They're going to subtly influence the Kens into turning against each other. And while they're busy fighting amongst themselves, the Barbies will stop the proposed changes to the Constitution, putting the power firmly back in their hands, as it always should be. Okay, credit where credit is due, this is actually a genius plan, but there is a problem. Keeping the Kens as second-class citizens is only going to lead to another revolt in the future. With this in mind, what the Barbies really need to do here is what the little girls who play with them are taught to do and learn to share. I know, I know, it's a crazy concept, but hear me out. Barbie Land can still be Barbie Land, but by giving the Kens an area of their own, like their own Ken Man Cave, essentially the boys will have a place where they can still feel like they're in charge, without causing any more harm for society as a whole. Mattel should be down to help out with this since they don't want any more incidents either, and they've got the expertise to make it work. Barbie isn't their only brand after all. They've got plenty of experience creating things that the Kens would be into, like their line of WWE toys, or even Spirit the Horse, since Kens clearly love horses. Also, because Barbie Land crossing over with the real world has happened before, and will most likely happen again, the company should establish a network where they can help Barbies and their girls next time, instead of just trying to cover it up and put Barbie back in a box. It's time for the Barbies to put the last stage of their plan into action, and hopefully take Barbie Land back before the Kens ruin everything. That afternoon, Barbie returns to Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House and tells him that she's finally ready to be his long-term, low-commitment, casual girlfriend. Ken, of course, enthusiastically accepts the offer and announces that he wishes to celebrate this development in their situationship by serenading her with an acoustic cover of Matchbox 20 beside a bonfire on a moonlit beach. All of the other Barbies do the same with their targets, and just when the Kens finally let their guards down, they abruptly get up to go shower another Ken with affection, throwing them all into a jealous rage. Unable to cope with the inner turmoil brought on by this betrayal, Beach Ken decides that they only have one option. A civil war must be fought to determine which faction of Kens is truly the most deserving of the Barbie's affection. Early the next morning at 10 a.m. sharp, Ken and his troops storm the Malibu Beach, where they clash with their rivals using high-tech weaponry, like tennis rackets and frisbees, in a conflict so brutal that we may not be able to show it on YouTube. As casualties mount on both sides, Beach Ken and Rival Ken finally meet on the field of battle and beat each other off until they both explode with a burst of magical sparkles, catapulting them into their final showdown, which, of course, plays out as a highly choreographed dance routine. Expressing themselves through the power of dance actually ends up bringing the two sides together, and for a brief moment, there is peace in the kingdom. Unfortunately, the Kendom immediately crumbles because while they were distracted, the Barbies came together and restored their constitution. Barbie Land is Barbie Land once again, and the girls are back in charge. Upon returning to the neighborhood, Ken is devastated to see that his Mojo Dojo Casa House is back to being Barbie's dream house. Running inside while crying with shame, he collapses on the bed and tearfully admits to Barbie that he never really liked the pressure of being in charge at all, but was only doing it to get back at her for constantly turning him down. Although she still isn't looking for a relationship, Barbie apologizes to Ken for taking him for granted and explains that it isn't your possessions or the attention that you get from others that make you who you are. It's what you have inside that really matters. Now that he's finally able to determine his own self-worth, Ken is healed, but that still leaves Barbie to find her own happy ending. Just then, the old woman Ruth appears from out of the crowd. It turns out that she's actually Barbie's inventor and has come to show her what's next for her story, if she's ready to move on. Taking each other's hand, Ruth and Barbie walk off into the distance as everyone, including Ken, waves her a grateful goodbye. Eventually, the two find themselves in an endless white void between the worlds. Here, Barbie finally realizes that what she wants to create is ideas, not be an idea herself. She wants to be human. With Ruth as her guide, she experiences life through the memories of all the girls across history whose lives she's touched in countless, immeasurable ways. When she opens her eyes, Ruth is gone and Barbie is transported to the real world. Once there, she's welcomed in by Gloria and her family, who take her for her first appointment at 
where else but the gynecologist's office. The rift between the worlds is closed, Barbie Land is back, and the Kens have learned that just being themselves is enough. And stereotypical Barbie here finally gets to experience what it's like to be a real woman, ready for whatever challenges and new adventures that that may bring. But what would you do? If all of Barbie Land was threatened by your boyfriend Ken, would you and the girls squad up to defend your land? Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this. Oh yeah, <laughs> and have a damn good day.